That's better. Question. Which kind of bear is best? Bears. Beats. Battlestar Galactica. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. Oh, man. Well, that was dumb. But here we are, many days into this strange coronavirus situation. Uh, hopefully you're having lots of fun binge-watching The Office in addition to binge-watching my lectures. Hope you've survived exam three. Uh, today, <clears throat> and for the rest of the semester basically, we're going to be talking about a subject that uh, is not covered in a lot of detail in your text. And that is the uh, chemical mechanisms of metabolism. And this is a subject that your uh, future biochemistry professors have specifically asked us in, in OCHEM to teach to you. So this is going to be very important for your future understanding. The challenge is that this material isn't covered very well in your text. And so there's not, it's difficult for me to write a conventional study guide as I have done previously with the chapters that are from the Smith text. So you're gonna have to focus on the lecture notes and then online resources to learn more about glycolysis. I'll try to make it clear what you're responsible for, uh, but um, you'll, you will have to take a step back from maybe uh, having something specific in the study guide to tell you uh, what's important. All right, well, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. All right, well, this lecture involves a lot of structures that are uh, complicated enough that I didn't want to take the time to draw them in silence while you sat there watching. I figure you can pause the video at any time to catch up with drawing the molecules. Uh, but we're going to begin by looking at an overview of glucose metabolism, starting with glycolysis, which takes place in the cytosol. And uh, the overall change that happens in the reactions of glycolysis is to take glucose and uh, break it into two identical molecules of, that are called pyruvate. And in the process, we're going to convert ADP and inorganic phosphate, we'll talk about what that is in just a little bit, into two molecules of ATP. We'll convert two molecules of NAD plus into two molecules of NADH, and we'll talk about uh, what that is later. And then these waters and, proton uh, and hydroniums are just there to balance out the charges in the equation. Um, so glycolysis will go from glucose to pyruvate and we'll talk about the reactions and mechanisms that connect us from the start to the finish. Um, next is sort of a bridge between the steps of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. This is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex uh, which occurs, uh, which exists in the mitochondrial matrix. And this reaction takes pyruvate, which is brought in to the mitochondria from the cytosol, and uh, does what's called an oxidative decarboxylation. So you're going to lose CO2. Dallin would like to get a video leap editor for free from the App Store, that's fun. Um, anyway, you're going to lose CO2, and then this carbon here that used to be a ketone is going to end up as the thioester, and that's the oxidation step. So we're going to convert pyruvate into uh, this molecule, which is called acetyl-CoA. It's an acetyl group bound up in a thioester with a thiol, which we've named CoA with an S on it. We'll show you what the structure of that CoA is. But this is one of the uh, CO2 groups that we're going to lose as we convert glucose 
all the way to CO2. I should point out that uh, from this point on, as we do, uh, as we start with pyruvate and get acetyl CoA, uh, these reactions happen twice because uh, one molecule of glucose converts to two molecules of pyruvate. Uh, along the way, we also get uh, another NADH molecule. And then finally, in the citric acid cycle, we take acetyl-CoA and these cofactors, I should have corrected this here, that's GDP, not gross domestic product, but guanosine diphosphate. And we'll talk about the structure of that in a little bit. But we're going to convert acetyl-CoA into two molecules of CO2. That involves us oxidizing both of the carbons in acetyl-CoA and breaking a carbon-carbon bond. That's going to get us three molecules of NADH and one molecule of FADH2 uh, and then one of GTP. We'll talk again about what all of these things stand for, but I just wanted to get you give you an overview of uh, the process. The NADH and FADH2 molecules are very useful because they can transport electrons to the electron transport chain where they drive the formation of a proton gradient across the mitochondrial membrane and as protons come back in uh, to the mitochondrial membrane through uh, a particular multi-subunit complex, uh, an ATP synthetase, uh, they drive the synthesis of ATP. Uh, so for example, uh, and the ultimate acceptor of electrons is oxygen, which is why we need oxygen to, uh, to survive and to do uh, metabolism, but NADH ultimately will donate two of its electrons to oxygen, converting oxygen into H2O, same with FADH2. Um, and it's estimated that you get about three molecules of ATP for each molecule of NADH that arrives at the electron transport chain, and also that you get two molecules of ATP per molecule of FADH2 um, that arrives at the electron transport chain. So if we go back and sort of add all of these steps together, from glucose and glycolysis all the way through the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to the citric acid cycle. Uh, you're going to get, after you convert glucose to six molecules of CO2, you're going to get two FADH molecules and 10 NADH molecules, two ATP and two GTP. Theoretically, you could get about 30 if you take these factors listed here for how many ATP per NADH and FADH2. You could get as many as 30 ATP molecules from 38 ATP molecules from one molecule of glucose. However, in reality, it's less efficient than that. There is leakage of the proton gradient over the across the membrane. Not every proton that makes its way inside the membrane uh, down the gradient goes through the uh, ATP synthase complex. Um, but with this in mind, we can start to have an idea of how much glucose a human needs to survive every day. Um, you need about 100 to 150 moles of ATP daily. That's the average human, give or take. Uh, so if we get 30 molecules of ATP uh, from one molecule of glucose, that means you need 3 to 5 moles of glucose to survive, and that... Uh, you do the math is anywhere from 600 to 900 grams of glucose, almost a whole kilogram of glucose, which uh, is a lot when you think about it, but that's why we're always hungry. So um, before we get into the specifics, the, the chemical mechanisms of glycolysis in the citric acid cycle, I wanted to introduce the key small molecule players. Uh, so first, we're going to introduce adenosine diphosphate. Um, so ADP we get from adenosine diphosphate. Uh, let's look at the ADP molecule a little bit more closely. 
A is for adenine. This is a purine base. It's got a six and a five member ring fused together, four nitrogens in the ring, and an amino group outside of the ring. Uh, that's adenine. In blue is the five carbon sugar pentose. Uh, it's called ribose. It's typical to number the uh, carbons in the ribose ring uh, with one and a superscripted apostrophe or prime. So this is the anomeric carbon here, the one that's bonded to oxygen and nitrogen is one prime, then two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime is that exocyclic CH2 group. Uh, the stereochemistry of both of these OH groups on ribose is down. Uh, the uh, adenine is in the sort of beta anomeric position. Uh, together, adenine and ribose uh, constitute adenosine, and uh, that's what we call a nucleoside. If you start adding phosphate groups to the 5' prime hydroxyl of ribose, we call it a nucleotide. Here is ADP, and it has two phosphate groups. One, the alpha phosphoryl group is bonded to the 5' prime hydroxyl of ribose, and then the alpha phosphoryl group is bonded to the beta phosphoryl group via this, uh, what we're going to call the phosphorus-oxygen phosphorus connection called a pyrophosphate or phosphoanhydride bond. Uh, you can think of that bond as analogous to a carbon anhydride. If you remember, carbon anhydrides look like this, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, uh, maybe an acetyl group here, an oxygen, and then another acetyl group. Uh, the uh, anhydride bond is reactive because the leaving group is uh, resonance stabilized, so a nucleophile can come in and attack the carbonyl carbon, and ultimately the leaving group will leave. Phosphoanhydrides are similar. You have a phosphorus doubly bonded to oxygen and another phosphorus doubly bonded to oxygen with an oxygen in the middle, and you might imagine that if a nucleophile attacks at this phosphorus, the electrons in the bond between the beta phosphorus and this oxygen could leave onto that oxygen where they'd be stabilized by resonance. I'll also point out that ADP along with ATP are frequently, or rather almost always in biological contexts, uh, bonded to magnesium uh, cation. That's a doubly charged or divalent cation, and it uh, binds to the negatively charged oxygens uh, within the diphosphate group uh, and uh, acts as a counter ion that uh, stabilizes the highly negatively charged uh, phosphate groups. Um, in general, what we say for ADP will apply for, a, for GDP. Uh, there are some variant versions of ATP that are called guanosine triphosphate because they have this guanine base in place of the adenine base. We'll, we won't see GDP and GTP till we get to the citric acid cycle. Um, all right. Um, Next, we'll talk about inorganic phosphate. This is what uh, your biochemistry and biology text will call basically the conjugate base of phosphoric acid. It doesn't have carbons in it, so they call it inorganic phosphate. Um, at pH 7, uh, two forms of uh, phosphate are present in about equal amounts. Um, the monoanion, the uh, doubly protonated phosphoric, uh, well, let's see, the uh, monoanion is in equilibrium with its conjugate base, the dianion, and the pKa is about 7, meaning at physiological pH, it's, uh, it's a toss-up between either of these two structures. 
Uh, inorganic phosphate is a fairly stable um, leaving group. You can tell that it's a good leaving group because uh, it is the conjugate base of a strong acid. So if you take a look at phosphoric acid, the first pKa is around 2. So we'll see. Um, this is in the range that it could be a good leaving group and a good nucleophile. So we're going to see both characteristics uh, in these metabolic reactions, good leaving group and good nucleophile. Okay, ATP is just like ADP, only we've got two phosphoanhydride bonds instead of one. I'll point out, maybe again, if I didn't say it above, that to keep things straight, we give letters alpha, beta, and gamma to the three phosphoryl groups in ATP, starting with the one closest to the sugar, alpha, beta, gamma. And many reactions, because phosphoanhydride bonds are weak, many reactions involve some nucleophile attacking the gamma phosphoryl group with ADP as the leaving group. Um, and that reaction is sometimes called phosphorylation. So let me give you an example of a reaction that you might uh, encounter as we talk about metabolism. We'll call this uh, phosphorylation of alcohols. Uh, and reactions like this are typically catalyzed by a class of enzymes, enzymes called kinases. And um, <clears throat> the reaction goes something like this. You're going to use the alcohol oxygen as the nucleophile. Uh, you will find with uh, biochemical reaction mechanisms that we start to be sloppy with proton transfers. Uh, for example, this oxygen probably needs to be more nucleophilic than just a neutral oxygen for it to attack the phosphorus. Um, a base from an enzyme will likely remove this proton. Uh, it's not clear in many cases whether or not you actually form the negatively charged oxygen intermediate or whether these electrons go on to attack the gamma phosphorus of ATP at the same time as the base is removing the proton. So we'll actually show all of that in one step to make things a little bit easier. So lone pairs on the base attack the proton, electrons in the oxygen-hydrogen bond act as a nucleophile so that oxygen can attack the gamma phosphoryl group. And at that point, uh, the weak phosphoanhydride bond breaks with the electrons from that bond going on to this oxygen. Um, you can think of uh, this mechanism happening mostly via an SN2 reaction, uh, that is nucleophilic substitution. Um, it's not clear whether what I've drawn here in brackets with the double dagger is an intermediate or a transition state. Uh, it's somewhat controversial and it depends on the enzyme. Uh, and uh, so we're going to just be sort of agnostic on that point. But you can see that as uh, the SN2 reaction is happening, the, uh, we're forming a new bond between the oxygen of the alcohol and the phosphorus. At the same time, we're breaking a bond between the phosphorus, the, the gamma phosphorus, and the oxygen on the beta phosphoryl group. Um, and some people think that in some cases there's actually a pentacoordinate phosphate intermediate uh, that exists and then kicks off ADP as a leaving group. Uh, we'll go ahead and stick with the SN2 mechanism because it's a little simpler. Um, what we're left with is a phosphorylated alcohol, and then ADP is our leaving group. Now I want to say a little bit about the thermodynamics of this reaction. Uh, if we look at bonds made versus bonds broken, we break a phosphoanhydride bond, we make a new um, 
phosphoester bond, and I put the arrow in the wrong place. So let's figure that out. The bond we're making is this oxygen phosphorus bond. Um, which do you expect to be stronger? Well, we haven't done a lot with phosphoanhydrides and phosphoesters yet, but you can reason your way through this uh, by comparison to uh, between carbon anhydrides and carbon esters. Okay, so uh, compare these two bonds, which bond is stronger? Or compare the two carbons, which carbon is more reactive? And we learned in chapter 22 that anhydrides are more reactive because the thing that's attached is a better leaving group. So let's highlight the leaving group in gray. The leaving group here would be the resonance stabilized acetate anion, which is the conjugate base of acetic acid pK about 4. The leaving group for the ester, though, would be a negatively charged oxygen. Uh, conjugate base of the acid ethanol with pKa16. So acetate is more stable than ethoxide, which means that it's easier for acetate to leave than it is for ethoxide to, to leave. Therefore, anhydrides are more reactive and esters are less reactive. Similarly, uh, phosphoanhydrides are more reactive than phosphoesters, and phosphoanhydride bonds are weaker than phosphoester bonds. So this reaction is typically exothermic because you're replacing a weaker phosphoanhydride bond with a stronger phosphoester bond. Now, sometimes we'll run this uh, reaction somewhat backwards. Uh, this will be the case uh, for some phosphoesters that have an especially weak phosphoester bond. Uh, we call this reaction substrate level phosphorylation of ADP, and this is a step in glycolysis. It's basically the reverse of the mechanism I just showed you, uh, where the ox negatively charged oxygen on the beta phosphoryl group will attack the phosphorus of the phosphoester, and leaving group leaves and picks up a proton on the way off from enzyme or solvent, releases your alcohol, and gives you ATP as a product. But the reaction only works if the bonds you form are stronger than the bonds you break above. And in at least one case in glycolysis, we're going to pay for this reaction by having an alcohol that can rearrange into a more stable um, isomer, rather uh, tautomerize into a more stable isomer. All right. So that's enough of ATP. Let's introduce a couple more players. I'm going to talk about some redox reagents now. NAD+, you've seen before a couple of times if you were with me in 351M, uh, and it's possible we discussed it a little bit this semester when we were talking about ketone and aldehyde reduction. Uh, NAD+, is the oxidized form of nicotinamide, there's your N, adenine, there's your A, and dinucleotide, there's your D. So nicotinamide is this portion uh, circled in orange. Adenine, of course, you've seen before, and that's the portion in pink. And then in between the two, you have a ribose ring attached to nicotinamide, a ribose ring attached to adenine, and the two are linked together by a pyrophosphate group we're going to call this a dinucleotide because you've got 
basically uh, nicotinamide monophosphate and adenine monophosphate linked together via a phosphoanhydride bond. But the business end of the molecule is this nicotinamide portion. Um, you might notice that uh, the nicotinamide ring is a pyridine ring. The nitrogen has a positive formal charge on it. Uh, but hopefully you can see that by resonance, that positive charge could be on these um, three carbons. And it will turn out that the most reactive is carbon-4 here. Um, you might also notice that uh, you've got on the nicotinamide ring an electron withdrawing group by resonance, which would make carbon-4 especially electron-poor. And uh, sometimes with oxidation agents, we um, compare their relative strengths by using something called uh, reduction potential. And this describes how favorable reducing uh, uh, the uh, reducing or oxidizing the molecule could be. So the NAD plus reduction potential, um, which we'll describe as this in volts, is equal to about minus 0 0.32. And I think that's relative to, I don't know. Anyway. Um, all right. Let's look at the reduced form of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Looks like we got a copy and paste error there, so I'll go ahead and correct that. Um, in the reduced form, we have delivered a hydride to that very reactive carbon-4. Um, so going from NAD plus to uh, NADH is a question of hydride delivery. And um, one of the reasons this can happen is because, another copy and paste error, whoops, once you do the reduction reaction and deliver a hydride, your molecule is now neutral. Uh, your, your, I'm sorry, your nicotinamide ring is now neutral. It's no longer aromatic, but it's neutral. And so you have these two offsetting factors between NAD plus and NADH, and in NAD plus the nicotinamide ring is aromatic but positively charged. In NADH, the, the ring, nicotinamide ring is not aromatic but it's neutral. One of the reactions we'll see happen between uh, involving NAD plus is in, in these uh, react in these reactions of glycolysis in the citric acid cycle is oxidation of an alcohol to a ketone. So what happens here, and I'm only drawing the business end of the molecule, um, the uh, nicotinamide ring portion, uh, some base from enzyme or solvent will remove a proton from your alcohol at the same time, or uh, perhaps not exactly at the same time, but perhaps as the proton is being removed, electrons from the oxygen-hydrogen bond kick down to form a new oxygen-carbon pi bond, and H- minus is handed off directly to carbon-4, the electrophilic carbon of NAD+. And then the remainder of these two arrows are just necessary so we don't violate the octet rule. If we stopped here by making a new bond between the hydrogen from the alcohol and the pink carbon-4 of NAD+, we'd have too many bonds to carbon, so we have to shift this carbon-carbon pi bond over and then shift this one over as well onto the nitrogen. And then NADH is the product, as is the ketone. 
in this reaction, the alcohol gets oxidized to the ketone and NAD plus gets reduced to NADH. Uh, now we'll see another redox reagent uh, in the citric acid cycle called FAD. Oh, you know what? I forgot to point out that It doesn't matter what I forgot. Oh well. All right, so FAD stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide. Um, so the structure here in the blue and pink portion are exactly the same as for NAD+. The difference is in this orange group that's attached to the anomeric carbon of your ribose ring. The ribose ring plus that orange group are called riboflavin, which just happens to be vitamin B2. And this portion is called flavin. Um, and uh, it turns out that the uh, electrophilic nitrogen on flavin, well, there's multiple places that the flavin is electrophilic on. Um, but this nitrogen is one of them, and uh, we can deliver hydrides to that nitrogen. Um, you will notice if we did deliver a hydride to that nitrogen, we might push arrows something like this and pick up a proton from some other source. Uh, sometimes the flavin chemistry is more complicated than this, so I won't push those uh, arrows here, but the reduced form of flavin has a new nitrogen-hydrogen bond here and another one there. And so in effect, from uh, to get from FAD to FADH2, you have to deliver H minus and you have to deliver H plus. Or you can think about it as delivering two protons plus two electrons. Uh, flavins are known to participate in single electron type reactions as well. We won't necessarily worry about that. Interestingly, the reduction potential of the flavin in volts is plus 0.031, so a much, uh, a much smaller reduction potential, uh, suggesting that uh, FAD is less reactive than FAD, I'm sorry, than NAD+. Plus. All right. So a couple other players, this FAD and FADH2, NAD plus and NADH were for redox chemistry. Um, another cofactor or small molecule that participates in some of this chemistry is thiamine pyrophosphate. Here is the thiamine portion in orange, the pyrophosphate portion in blue. Thiamine happens to be vitamin B1, and so if you look on your cereal box in the morning and if you see riboflavin or thiamine, that's what you're looking at. Um, the carbon-hydrogen bond here in the thiamine heterocycle, this is called a thiazole ring, uh, positively charged form, I guess you'd call it thiazoleum, uh, but that proton which I'll highlight here, is somewhat acidic because if you remove it, you have a neutral conjugate base. Only the conjugate base has a positive charge on the nitrogen and a negative charge on the carbon. And molecules where you have 
uh, positive and negative charges on adjacent atoms, uh, but you can't do anything to make a new pi bond by resonance. These are called ILIDs. Y-L-I-D, ILID. Uh, this is the conjugate base of thiamine pyrophosphate. And uh, we need to take a little bit of a closer look at that ILID thiazolium ring, or that ILID thiazole ring, uh, because it will have some interesting and unique reactivity. So let's just zoom in on that thiazole ring. Uh, we've simplified the molecule. We've got an R group attached to nitrogen. Uh, kind of like we did over here, only we're not drawing that uh, ring that's attached to the nitrogen. You have a methyl group on this carbon and then another R group. That's this chain here that we're also not drawing. You've got the nitrogen and the sulfur. And uh, in the conjugate base, you have a carbon, uh, well, I'm sorry, you have non-bonding lone pairs in an sp2 type orbital. And if that's difficult to see, oops, I'm just going to copy that and we'll forget that we'll uh, have this be just the thiamine molecule. All right, so uh, if you look at the thiamine pyrophosphate molecule, the carbon-hydrogen bond that I said was somewhat acidic is in the plane of the ring. If a base comes along and removes that proton, the electrons go on to the ring carbon, but they're held in an sp2 type orbital, orthogonal to the pi system, so they can't be delocalized by resonance. So you have a negative charge adjacent to a positive charge. Uh, because I said this molecule can be, the, the ILID is interesting because it can be both nucleophilic and electrophilic at the same carbon. It's a nucleophile, certainly, because of these non-bonding lone pairs in an sp2 type orbital, not resonance stabilized. But if you look at this carbon-nitrogen pi bond, you would, with a positive charge on the nitrogen, that looks like an iminium type species. Uh, and the LUMO, you'd think, would be the empty carbon-nitrogen pi star. That's an oversimplification. But if we were going to do carbonyl chemistry here, we can see clearly how we'd have a nucleophile attack at the carbonyl carbon. Alternatively, you can draw the resonance structure where you have, you move uh, the electrons from the pi bond over onto the nitrogen. Uh, so now those electrons that used to be in the pi bond are uh, a non-bonding lone pair on nitrogen, and you have a positive formal charge on the ring carbon, uh, and that's associated with this empty p orbital, but then at the same carbon you have a negative charge <laughs> Uh, with an sp2 with electrons in an sp2 type orbital, um, so we might call this a uh, well a molecule with a filled orbital and an empty orbital on the same carbon, a filled non-bonding orbital and an empty non-bonding orbital on the same carbon can both can that atom can be both a nucleophile and an electrophile, and we'll show you examples of that when we come to it in the process. Thiamine pyrophosphate is involved in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and is involved a little bit later in the citric acid cycle as well. All right, another cofactor you will encounter is another sort of redox cofactor called lipoate. It can exist in an oxidized form and a reduced form. Uh, so the portion from the carbonyl carbon to the end is from lipoic acid, and it is involved in an amide bond with the epsilon amino group of lysine. Uh, in the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction. 
Uh, so kind of a long and flexible hydrocarbon chain, probably a fairly lipophilic environment. But at the end, you have this five-membered ring containing a disulfide bond. Uh, and you can reduce that bond by uh, under various conditions to get the dithiol form. And we'll see that uh, going from the oxidized to the reduced form is an important part of the pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, complex. And then lastly on our list of strange biological molecule participants in metabolism is this molecule called coenzyme A, uh, which thankfully its chemistry is mostly about the nucleophilic thiol here in the orange. So we're going to abbreviate it and call it CoA SH. The SH is to remind us that you've got the nucleophilic thiol there. Nevertheless, it's a fairly large and detailed molecule. The A stands for adenine here in pink. Uh, you have a ribose ring, but here the three prime hydroxyl group is uh, participating in a phosphoester. The five prime hydroxyl group is bonded to this pyrophosphate group which is itself bonded to this uh, pantothenic acid, uh, which itself is a combination of pantoic acid and beta alanine in the dimer. You don't need to memorize this structure or the configuration of that stereocenter. And then at the end, the business end of the molecule here in orange is cysteamine, it's derived from the amino acid cysteine, but the big important part is this thiol nucleophile. So you can think of coenzyme A as a nucleophile with a big handle, and the enzyme uses the handle to get the nucleophile to where it needs to be. All right, so that summarizes the types of molecules we will see in metabolism. When we talk next, we'll be talking about the reactions of glycolysis, and we'll talk about the chemical logic behind each step. But in uh, some of these cases, I will refer you back to mechanistic steps that we've drawn here so that we don't need to duplicate any effort. For example, the first step of glycolysis involves phosphorylation of an alcohol via a mechanism just like this. All right, so with that, good luck. Uh, in this section of the class, many people start to uh, ask me, so what exactly do we need to know from all of this? Um, and of course, the lovely answer would be, well, nothing. I just enjoy talking about meaningless things. Uh, the horrible answer would be, well, everything. Uh, I want you to know and memorize everything. The answer is somewhere in between. I certainly don't uh, expect you to memorize the structures, but I do expect you to understand their reactivity, be able to uh, predict their reactivity based on what you know, and to be able to understand the mechanisms that they participate in, uh, understand the thermodynamics of the reactions they participate in, uh, so that you can understand biological processes at the molecular level. All right, with that, we'll finish for today, and I'll see you next time.